not everyone who has constipation has IBS, but everyone who has IBS C has constipation. And there are even several patterns of constipation that can masquerade as other forms of IBS. Sneaky. So how does that work? Well, well, uh, I'm specifically thinking about IBS D or even IBS M, the mixed IBS, because I actually think in many cases, these are constipation. Let me give you a quick example, Jonathan. Someone could have zero bowel movements for uh, several days in a row. And then all of a sudden they have this one day where the first bowel movement comes and it's formed, but then they keep having more and more bowel movements as the day goes on. And the, the, the bowel movements, they get looser and looser to the point of being water. So this person, they think they have diarrhea, but it's from my perspective, this is actually constipation. So they're sort of backed up for days until they're sort of effectively set to explode. Yeah, to put it delicately, Jonathan. Okay, not a not a technical term. Okay, so um, you know maybe maybe coming to to my own experience, I was diagnosed with IBS in my early twenties, so a um, little more than twenty five years ago. After I had been very sick with with glandular fever, which is mononucleosis for for you will in the states, um, for sort of six months, and at that time. You know, I remember this really well. None of the gastroenterologists that I saw thought that any of the microbes in our gut mattered at all. This is basically pre the time when the microbiome had been discuss discovered. Um, so at the time, they were basically convinced that IBS was probably largely caused by stress. And that basically, if you could get yourself really relaxed, then probably this would solve most of this problem. Um, uh, is that a real thing still today, or is that a myth from a time before we understood the importance of our of our gut bacteria and just sort of the complexity of what was going on inside our gut? When it comes to the connections between stress and the manifestations in our gut, there are very there is very clearly a psychological element to IBS. In fact, Jonathan, one study found that patients with IBS reported more lifetime and daily stressful events than control groups. That's interesting. And well, does this mean that stress is a cause or just a result of an unhappy gut? Because, you know, again, thinking back to when I had this, like if you've got a really bad stomach and it may be impacting your quality of life, I mean, you're going to feel stressed as a result of this. Which way round is it? Looking at the data, stress has been linked to the onset of symptoms and then the symptoms improve when the stress is gone. So there's that. And another study found that patients with IBS showed increased levels of anxiety, depression, and phobias. Um, so I think that there's sort of a little bit of both going on here, Jonathan. Which I have learned in everything to do with the human body is is common, right? It's never as simple as one thing. So, so the, the team who looked at this found a recent study, very recent study from 2021 of over 50,000 people with IBS around the world. Uh, and the researchers in that study found that people with IBS were more likely to have anxiety. And when I think back to where my symptoms were were really bad, which is sort of right at the beginning of my early 20s, I was definitely, you know, I mean, maybe not medically depressed by this, but definitely, you know, depressed by this in, in sort of common language. And, um, and I thought what was interesting is the study also found that people with both IBS and anxiety were more likely to have been treated frequently with antibiotics during childhood. And the study authors suggested that repeated use of antibiotics during childhood might increase the risk of IBS and anxiety by altering the normal gut bacteria, which in turn influences nerve cell development and mood. The team was very careful, though, to say that this doesn't necessarily mean that anxiety causes IBS symptoms or vice versa. It's just that these things are very much interconnected. It's hard to separate them. And I know one of the things I was amazed to discover is like this huge amount of nerves and immune system control in our gut, right? So actually the brain and the gut, they really are linked. It's not just one of those things that, uh, that, that people say. Oh, 100%. So, Will, we've gone over what IBS is, how it's diagnosed, the role that stress and anxiety might play. What about how to manage symptoms if, you know, any of our listeners are saying, you know, I think I do have IBS or indeed I've been diagnosed with it? Yeah, so, first of all, to those listeners, you have to understand treatment is always going to be individualized. Um, so, it's a little bit hard to completely generalize when, you know, IBSD and IBSC are sort of different things in terms of how you attack them. 
But there are some general rules that we can use, and that's what I wanted to address today. Some patients see improvement in their symptoms very quickly if they take these simple steps. Cut out caffeine, alcohol, and spicy and fatty foods. That's funny. I remember being told very specifically to cut out broccoli. <laughs> well, that's uh, discriminatory against broccoli, but nonetheless, there there is this... Um, there, there is also the concept of the low FODMAP diet, Jonathan, which is usually a secondary thing. Tell us what a low FODMAP diet is, Will. FODMAP is a very nerdy thing. Stands Standing for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. That's a real mouthful, if you'll excuse the pun. Yeah, it, it basically means different types of sugar that the small intestine struggles to absorb. The idea is that you will temporarily reduce these foods or temporarily eliminate these foods so that you can gather an understanding of what's happening with your body. And Will, what are the sort of things that you would cut out if you were doing this? Um, you may start with things like milk and ice cream, wheat, beans, lentils, even some fruit and veggies like onions and apples and garlic, again, all temporary. But you can also start with a much more limited version where you would temporarily restrict dairy and gluten-containing products. And what about supplements or anything else that we can take for IBS instead of like effectively excluding things? So there's been mixed evidence, um, but there are some that stand out in terms of potentially being helpful. So one is peppermint oil. Uh, peppermint oil seems to really help in terms of abdominal discomfort and bloating. The, the menthol seems to have a soothing effect on the small intestine. There was also a 2014 paper showing that probiotics can improve IBS symptoms. Now, in this paper, they said the quality of the existing studies is limited. And as a gastroenterologist, I would agree with that. Probiotics are not the solution for everyone. But when you find the right probiotic, it can actually be very helpful for many people. And the last thing that I would say is that I've had great success with, with some fiber supplements, specifically psyllium husk or soluble fiber supplements, Jonathan. Amazing. So it's nice to know there's some things that one can try. Um, now, away from dietary measures, I also heard that acupuncture can help. It's interesting, Jonathan. A, a 2009 clinical trial of 230 participants with IBS found that those who received acupuncture actually did better than those who did not. Another thing you could try is mindfulness. This can be very helpful to some people. And this, this could be as simple as doing breathing exercises. I've had great success as well, Jonathan, using something called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Now, this is something I usually use in addition to medical treatments. And of course, we should mention that there are medications that are commonly used for IBS. Now, I'm not a fan of just medications. I think we should be including these other things. But there are some that are really effective. And something that's interesting is that we have sort of repurposed many of the medications that were developed to treat depression. We are uh, using to treat irritable bowel syndrome, but we use them at a much lower dose. So when it comes to medicines, once again, um, you have to make choices based upon the person's individual's, individual needs. And so, Will, what if someone's listening to this, they've been diagnosed with IBS, they've changed their diet, they've changed some of their treatments, but things are still not getting better? You know, this is such a big topic and there's so much that we could talk about here, Jonathan. But one of the things that I would say is that people should, if you have your old bowel syndrome, or frankly, even if you don't, we should all be orienting our diet and lifestyle towards supporting the gut microbiome. Because ultimately, the gut microbiome plays a central role in the development of IBS. I think that we've made that clear in our conversation today. And therefore, our solution should include centrally a focus on improving and elevating the gut microbiome. Now, there are some people that in particular I've taken care of through the years, Jonathan, who like they've literally tried everything and these people are desperate and they're just not getting better. Their quality of life is, you know, in, in shambles. And when this is the case, typically my first approach is to ask the question, is this really IBS? Because if you can identify an alternative cause, that may be the solution to fixing the problem. That may be why you're not getting better. Another thing that people should consider is the power of the brain-gut connection. Yeah, throughout my career, Jonathan, I have witnessed this so many times 
where the connections between our digestive issues and our mood or having a history of trauma can actually be fueling these problems. 